Hi, I am Erin Joyce. I am the district consultant with the Oil Creek Library District, <clears throat> which covers Clarion, Jefferson, and Venango County. So this is a project with all 12 to 14 libraries of the district working together. We have gotten a grant to do this for you guys from the National Network of the Libraries of Medicine. For some reason, this went backwards on me. So this grant is not letting me go backwards. <laughs> This grant is funded through an award from the Network of the National Library of Medicine, the Middle Atlantic Region, and they are a partner of the All of Us Research Program. So one of the things that goes with this grant is they want us to talk to you about what this program does. Um, this is basically a program that allows people to join and partner with researchers to give them some health data to help uh, figure out why people are getting sick or staying healthy and the researchers are able to look at patterns in a humongous group of people. And it is one of the research programs that is a resource for many of the different medical studies that you see coming out through the world. If you have any questions about the All of Us research program, you can visit www.joinallofus.org slash NLM. And I will put that link in the follow-up email as well. Um, the next thing we wanted to tell you about was the Medline Plus. This is basically your Google for health information, primarily governmental. So it has the in information from National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control, Mayo Clinic, Nemers Foundation, those kinds of places. So Medline Plus is a good place to go if you're having any questions or you're Googling and you're not sure what is a good resource, the Medline Plus is a good place to start including the mental health subtopic. So you can play around with that. And I will put the link to this page in the follow-up email as well. And if you know anybody who needs um, different languages, they have a lot of different instructional PDFs, the things that they send you home within the hospital and things like that that are in different languages. So if you know anybody who needs that kind of resource, that is also available on Medline Plus. We wanna thank them for sponsoring our program today. And we will get started. I'm going to turn it over to our presenter for the topic, Andrew Shirey of Spiro Group LLC, which is headquartered in New Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in Clarion County. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Andrew. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, like Aaron said, my name is Angie Shirey. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I have a, a private group practice in New Bethlehem, PA, where we work with individuals, and we also work with organizations and businesses to provide trainings about all things mental health and even interpersonal skills. Um, in a second here, let me share my screen. So we're gonna be talking about uh, managing depression and anxiety today. And this is the first in a series of topics on mental health um, that Aaron is putting together with local providers in Clarion, Jefferson, um, and Venango counties. I wanna take a, just a minute to thank Aaron for bringing this topic to our neck of the woods. Um, mental health in rural areas has been notoriously um, a shortfall in medicine. So I'm really happy to be presenting on this and to, to start, start the discussion. Um, there is a stigma around mental health. So the more that we can talk about it and the more that we can normalize it, the better. So when we talk about mental health, um, we talk about physical health, you know, we think about, you know, 
we take care of every part of our body. You know, we take medication when we need to take medication, we exercise, hopefully whenever we need to exercise, um, but we don't necessarily take care of our mental health in the way that we take care of the rest of our body. And I believe we are in a period of time when we need to start prioritizing that. And I'm hoping that we make the shift for mental health to something similar along the lines of how we care for our dental health. Um, so, you know, you go to the dentist every six months, if you have a problem or you have a cavity, you make an appointment and you get it fixed. But through, you know, taking care of our dental health, we learn to brush, we learn to floss, we learn to attend to it every day. And my hope, and I believe this is happening, is that we're moving to that with mental health as well, where we find those equivalent things of brushing and, and flossing to how we take care of our mental health. So exercise, meditation, therapy, all of those type of, types of things. And um, we're at a place in time and history where we, our brains are being taxed in a way that they have never been taxed before. And that's showing because it just can't handle it. Our, our mental health just can't handle the level of input, the level of stimulation that we get on a regular basis. So we're at a point in time where we really need to take care of that. It's a fact that 20% of us will experience a diagnosable mental illness in any given year. And I actually think this is kind of low, um, but you know, if we ourselves, have not experienced it, we're going to know or love somebody who has experienced depression, anxiety, bipolar, or even incidental, you know, adjustment type disorders when we're going through something tough. Um, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the US and the second for young adults. And that has been growing every year for like the last 10 years. And I think that this discussion about attending to our mental health is even more important now in light of the pandemic and everything that we've all experienced over this last year. So our goals for today are to look at the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety, some tips to manage it, and then some resources. So when I think about depression and anxiety, I think of them as cousins. You know, a lot of times where depression is, um, anxiety shows up and vice versa. If anxiety is there, depression shows up. So there are a lot of overlapping signs um, and symptoms um, and how to deal with them are sometimes pretty similar. Um, if you have a direct question, just ask Erin and she can interrupt and we can answer it. No questions yet, Mandy. in each of us. So what it might let, look like for your spouse or your partner is different than how it's going to look like for your coworker or your kids or your parents. So these are a, a set of guidelines that we're going to go, uh, go through, but it's important to know what it looks like for you. Okay, so sometimes I think about, you know, when we talk about depression, it is global. It affects every area of your life. So when people come into the office and we start to talk about it, I often use the comparison of um, gray colored glasses. So you know that you know when you first fall in love with somebody, you say you're looking at the world through rose colored glasses where everything is cheery and happy and like nothing is wrong, right? Well, depression is the opposite of that. It's like looking through the world, looking at the world through gray colored glasses. It touches everything. everything. Everything has that tinge of hopelessness or the way that we think about ourselves is negative. It touches every aspect of it. Um, so let's go through some of these, these signs and symptoms. So the first one is you have little interest or pleasure in doing things. And this is especially in things that you normally like to do. 
if nothing seems interesting or if nothing seems fun anymore or worth doing, um, you feel down, depressed, or hopeless. A lot of times people equate depression with sadness, and that's a pretty limited scope on what depression can look like. You know, it's more kind of a numbness or a general hopelessness or a lack of feeling. Um, when people come into the office, I always ask them two things, regardless. I ask you, how are you sleeping and how's your appetite? Because both of those things are are great indicators of mental health. And it can swing both ends of the spectrum. So you can have too much sleep or too little sleep. You have trouble falling asleep at night or hard time waking up in the morning. So you're getting two or three hours a night or it's really restless sleep or you're waking up at four or five in the morning or the other end of the spectrum. You're sleeping 11, 12 hours at night and then you're taking naps during the day. Either one of those are kind of an indicator of, of something's up with your mental health. And I can't tell you how many times I have people come in who say, well, I can't sleep, but I've never really been able to sleep. Um, and they just kind of accept it as, oh, that's just me. Um, but for, for me, when I'm looking at it, that's an indicator of mental health. And there can be, you can work on that. There's something that you can do about that. Um, a general feeling of just having no energy, um, feeling tired all the time, that general fatigue. Um, regarding your appetite, again, it can swing both ends of the spectrum. You know, you can eat too much, kind of eating all of the time, or just not having any appetite at all. And what goes with that are the weight changes up or down. And again, you know, some people are gonna, are gonna hit the cupboard and eat all of those comfort foods and other people are just going to have no interest whatsoever in, in eating. Um, another, another example of a symptom is having a hard time concentrating or making decisions and this can be big decisions but even down to the smallest decisions of where to eat, what to wear, I don't know if I should, if I should go here or if I should stay home. Um, any kind of persistent difficulty making decisions. And let me go back to, to sleep and appetite for a little bit too. You know, there's a difference between, you know, you have something big going on at work or a big project, there's a, you know, a, a deadline and you're having trouble sleeping in the days leading up to that, you know, three, maybe four days of poor sleep. Um, that's different than if you have like say 20 days in a row of really poor sleep, you know, three to four days of poor sleep is something that we kind of all experience. But if it gets up to that place of where that's a consistent thing for you, then that's where you need to pay attention that, hey, this might be more than just something I'm going through. This might be a sign of depression. Um, another thing that I see a lot of is when you feel bad about yourself, you have persistent feelings of being a failure or feelings of guilt. And I think this is where that, those gray colored glasses really come in handy because it clouds that, right? You, could, you can accomplish something really big or even something little, like, you know, say you have little ones at home and you do a great job at, you know, getting them ready every day and reading them books, but you, you consistently feel bad because you're not out there in the world doing other things. You know, depression has a way of only seeing the bad about yourself and not the things that you're doing well. So if that's a persistent thing, and sometimes when you're depressed, it's really hard to see that or have that perspective because it just feels so true and it feels so real that it's hard to, it's hard to, hard to see that there could be another, another possibility there that you could, you could be missing something. You know, I've had people in the office that they, they aren't able to, to say one good thing that they, about themselves, one good thing that they have gone for them or anything that they've accomplished. And it's not true, right? There are a lot of good things about them where they have strengths and they've accomplished things, but their depression is to a degree that they don't believe any of it's true. And they think that, that they, they don't think that they have any value or any worth. 
Um, another thing to watch out for is any changes in physical movement. And you can actually have that slowing down of, of how you walk or how you move or shuffling or just in general, not moving with purpose. Um, and again, this goes with that spectrum. You can have both ends. You can have that slow slowness of movement, but then you can also have this restless feeling where you can't sit still. Uh, because if you sit still, then all of those negative thoughts come in. So you just keep on moving, moving, moving. Um, and finally, we have, you know, thoughts that you'd be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way. Um, so we have, you know, not only can you have suicidal thoughts, thoughts of ending your life, but like ge a general feeling of just not wanting to be here or the people that you love would be better off if you weren't around. And also, you know, I, you know self-harm, cutting, or burning, those are all signs of, you know, pretty persistent depression or serious depression. So I think something to keep in mind, like generally, is that if your daily tasks are harder on a consistent basis, that it's, it's hard to think about getting a shower or doing your hair or taking care of yourself, that should be a red flag. Um, if you feel like nothing you do is good enough and you're constantly doubting yourself, that should be a red flag. Um, if the usual coping skills that you use aren't working anymore to make you feel better, um, then you got to pay attention. You know, so if if you know that going to lunch every Thursday with your friends is something that feels good. Um, but you get there and you can't, you don't even really want to talk to anybody or, you know, you have a hard time getting there, then you got to pay attention. Okay. Hey, I used to enjoy this. It used to make me feel connected. And now I just feel like I'm going through the motions. Um, pay attention to that. In general, if um, things become disorganized or untidy, you know, and you're having a hard time keeping up like that that again can kind of lead to it. And I think so many of us are feeling these things now um, with the pandemic and all of uh, the stress as a country that we've been feeling over the last year, that this sort of general malaise has set in that we kind of wanna do something, but we don't really feel like it. There's so much uncertainty that it's really brought a lot of these feelings up in us that we just, having a hard time coping and dealing and wanting to engage. Um, if you're having a hard time responding to text messages and calls, or you feel easy, easily overwhelmed, you should take a look at that. So I, I, I grabbed some memes off, of, off the internet just to kind of pull in here. I always joke. My kids use memes all the time. Half the time I understand them, half the time I don't. But I think this is a really nice one, a really good one to represent what depression really feels like. So, you know, that nothingness, you know, some sadness, huge self-loathing, anxiety, guilt feelings, and that tendency to just isolate. I think when we talk about depression too, I think we need to look at the connection with our physical problems too, and our physical or chronic health issues. In the last 10 or 15 years in, in our field, in the mental health field, Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of research in the field of trauma that, that kind of opened up this discussion. And what we see is, you know, when you have unexpressed emotion or you have, un, um, you know, things that have been not taken care of or untreated depression, that will really lead into or exacerbates chronic health problems. And a good example of this that I think about is, um, is fibromyalgia. And you know, the more depressed you feel, the worse your fibromyalgia symptoms are. And the more your fibro, you know, your more your fibromyalgia symptoms are present, <clears throat> the harder it is for you to deal with your depression. 
And there's a, and there's a big linkage between the two there um, when we look at chronic health problems and mental health problems. So pay attention, you know, if you have some chronic health issues going on, what's your mental health like? So <clears throat> let's look about, look at anxiety. And if you have any questions about the depression, um, just, just drop it in a question to Erin and I think she can pop in here and ask about it. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at anxiety in a little different way. And again, you're going to see a lot of overlap here between anxiety and depression. Um, one of the things that I work with people when they come into the office at first is just some emotional awareness or some uh, mental awareness. And we do this through connecting um, what our actions, our thoughts, how that feels in our body and our emotions are in connection to things that are happening. So when we went, look at anxiety, let's break it down a little bit like this. The behavioral, what we do, cognitive, what we think and body sensation, how that feels in our body. And again, this body sensation part is again, a push that's been happening in the last 10 or 15 years to pay attention to what our bodies are telling us. Because nine chances out of 10, our bodies are telling us things before, if we pay attention or if we're aware of it, faster than what we can cognitively be aware of it. So, um, so what does anxiety look like in our behavior? Um, we're always on guard. We're always on alert. Um, that hypervigilance, we, we're kind of paying attention to, you know, what's going to happen next waiting for the other shoe to drop, okay? I know this kid, this good can't last for very long. Always being on alert and looking for that. Irritability, you know, um, being grouchy all the time because, because you're always worried about what's gonna happen next. Restlessness um, and the sleep disturbance goes right along with, with um, depression. And some of the sleep disturbance is more you can't fall asleep because you just can't turn off your brain. Those thoughts are just going on and on and on and on. Um, and having the urge to avoid things that trigger anxiety. I think a good example of this is school avoidance. When kids are really anxious about going to school, um, they just don't want to go because it's too, they, they know that once they get there, their anxiety is just going to be ramped up. Um, so they just avoid going. They just don't want to go. They either have belly aches or stomach aches, or they just flat out refuse to go. Um, I think you can look at that too. Like if you have a hard time going out socially, um, you just tend to isolate and, and not interact with people because social situations are just, are just too anxiety provoking. So we look at our thoughts, okay? So how does this how does this impact us cognitively? Okay, so it's hard to concentrate. Um, you know, if you're having a hard time reading a book or finishing an article, pay attention to that. Um, racing thoughts, unwanted thoughts, things that you don't want to think of, or stuff that comes in from up in the past or the future. Um, those are all signs of, of anxious thoughts. Um, one of my favorite is, and a, and a client told me this, is future tripping. You know, that's the what if thing. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, what am I going to do? That endless trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. And in general, if you just have a hard time controlling that worry or anxiety. Um, the body sensations, I think, for anxiety is really interesting um, because for me, I... I know that I have some telltale signs of when I get anxious. You know, I definitely have that muscle tension. I get it around my back, my, my neck and my shoulders kind of tense up. Um, sometimes I can get all splotchy, which I hate. Everybody can see. Um, but it's important to kind of know how that shows up in, in yourself. You know, um, do you get sweaty? Does your breath your heart rate increase? Do you start breathing more shallow and, and more rapidly? I love this, <laughs> 30 seconds before the anxiety kicks in. Okay, so let's talk about some of the sneaky signs of depression and anxiety. 
um, and sometimes what's called you know high functioning depression. And I think it's important here to discuss how sometimes this depression looks differently in men and women. Um, you know, sometimes depression, and I don't want to, I hate to say just along gender lines, because this can be both men and women, but with men, it can come up as anger um, or being very short tempered. So something that normally wouldn't bother you, like you think about like, like a young father being at home and the kids didn't put their toys away and he flips out and kind of goes off and starts yelling about, you know, the toy not, toys not being put away. You know, the reaction doesn't necessarily equal what's really going on or doesn't connect with what's going on. So like being easily agitated or like kind of going off at the smallest things is a sign of depression, especially in men. Um, I think one thing that a lot of us struggle with now is this general sense of busyness, you know, always being busy. Um, that busyness, you know, always on the move or filling our lives with so many activities and so many things prevents us from having that stillness of mind or that quietness, because when that quietness pops up, sometimes it can be overwhelming because all those negative thoughts and those negative feelings or those anxious thoughts kind of pop in. Um, another sign is overworking, you know, burying ourselves in work. Um, generally work, we get a lot of external validation for that, you know, and we can see, oh, that is done. That's a good thing. This is something that I accomplished. Um, so rather than sitting with those uncomfortable feelings of, of not fitting in or not feeling our worth, we sink ourselves into work where we know we can get that from outside influences. So again, and, and I think a lot of times that shows up in men more than women, not that it doesn't show up in women, it certainly does, but overworking can be a sign of, of depression. A same goes along with risky behavior, you know, driving too fast or unhealthy choices uh, with sex or gambling or drinking too much. I think that generally, you know, if we have an over-reliance on our vi vices, whatever those, those are, and they can be many different things, you know, that, that, that drink after work turns into two drinks, then it turns into three and four. Once that starts to creep up, you know, that, that is an indication that we're coping in an unhealthy way with some mental health stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what some of those vices can be, because I think it's easy for us to look at, you know, drinking um, or gambling um, or even like chronic relationships as, as a vice, but sometimes we don't look at other things that are a little more commonplace. And one of those is shopping, you know, shopping gives us that same kind of hit, you know, that pleasure hit. When we, when we buy something. So if you find yourself spending a lot more time on the shopping networks or buying two or three of an item or your spending is a little out of control, you might be using shopping as a way to deal with some of these feelings. Um, I think another one that we are all really guilty of is spending time online and on social media. Um, somebody, I read this somewhere and I can't remember um, who it was, so I can't give them credit for the quote, but they referred to the internet as the most widely used analgesic, you know? So, you know, the most widely used um, pain management. So, and I think, and we're gonna talk about a little bit more about this later, you know, how many times do we hop online when we're bored? So instead of feeling bored, we hop online and we're scrolling, scrolling. We get on Facebook, we see the drug. So, so we have that distraction of our phones or our tablets or whatever it is.
I hope that makes sense. And if you have any questions, let Aaron know. Okay, so that's a little overview of what depression and anxiety can look like. And I'm sure that I missed a few um, in there, but hopefully that gives you a little bit uh, of an idea and definitely being aware of what those sneakier signs can be. And I think this is important, you know, let, let's bring the rural aspect of our area um, to light here for a second. I think that's, that's it's an important part of this discussion because, you know, as part of our culture, we don't really want to address that we're struggling, you know, and that's a big deterrent to getting the help that we need because culturally as rural folk, we, we don't want to air our dirty laundry. We don't want anybody else knowing our business. And we, we feel like we can take care of it ourselves. Um, and sometimes that prevents us from seeing these things clearly, mental health or depression or anxiety clearly, um, because it's like, you know, I know we talk about like older people, like, oh, I, you know, my grandma was on a nerve pill, you know, and that nerve pill was okay, but we can't talk about, you know, anxiety, or we can't talk about the fact that, that grandma was depressed. Um, so I think it's important to, to really look at, at some of those things that we don't necessarily think of as depression and anxiety and see how that fits in our lives. And if, if maybe we need to be paying attention a little bit more. Okay, so let's talk about the basics, okay, as far as managing your own mental health. I think later on in the series, Aaron has somebody coming on to talk about supporting loved ones with mental health. So I don't wanna go into that too much, but just for ourselves, what are the basics you can do? And let's bring in that, bring back that, that comparison to dental care. You know, there was a point in time when people didn't brush every day or floss or go to the dentist on a regular basis, but through education and understanding how your dental health is linked to your overall, you know, well-being, you know, we do those things. We don't even think about it, right? We don't even think about brushing our teeth being something that you have to do. It's a given. You just do it. Um, that's where some of these basics of attending to our mental health come in. You know, earlier I said, you know, our brains are being taxed at a level that has never happened in, in the history of the world before. We're constantly being stimulated, you know, whether it's, it's through our phones or watching the news, you know, there's always bells and whistles, new things going on that, that our brains were not So the first one, and, and, you know, some of these are the basic things that we all know is just move your body, you know, and this doesn't have to mean that you sign up for, you know, a subscription to Beach Body and you get rock hard abs. This can just be walking, stretching, yoga like, like stretches, just move your body on a regular basis somehow. You know, if we have a, a regularly sedentary lifestyle, that is not going to be good for our overall health mental health. Um, there are more and more um, studies now that have come out about what, what we're eating and how that impact, impacts our mental health, specifically, you know, how much sugar we're intaking and how that contributes to mood fluctuations. So you eat junk, you provide junk for your brain for fuel, then that's going to have an impact. So what are you eating? Are you making healthy choices? Um, Self-care, okay? I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but let's talk about um, just breathing and resetting your nervous system. You know, I can't tell you how many times people will come in and we'll talk about, you know, anxiety and starting to learn how to manage it. And I'll look over at them in session and they're like this, and it doesn't look like they're breathing at all. Um, the breath is a natural way to reset our nervous system and to begin to attend to, to taking care of ourselves in that way. 
um, when I first started practicing, I thought that breathing was BS and it was kind of like, you know, when you do all that breath work that it's like new age, you know, nonsense, but I was totally wrong. Everything comes back to the breath and paying attention to that. Um, if you have any kind of fitness tracker or an Apple watch, anything like that, those are really nice because they have natural kind of remember to breathe kind of things or alert, alerts on them. Use them, pay attention to them. Take nice deep abdominal breaths, bring that breath the whole way down to your breath, belly and exhale for just a little bit longer than you inhale. That's a great way to start to give yourself a little bit of space and time between how you're feeling and, and what you're doing. Just breathe in through your nose, all the way down to your belly, out through your mouth, just for a second longer than you inhale. Um, and then cultivating a mindfulness and meditative practice. Um, again, meditation, you know, 10 years ago was one of those things that was relegated to the, to like the corners, you know, to, to the fringes of society. But that's not really the case anymore because there's a lot of science that, that supports the, the positive effects of meditation, you know, being intentional about giving your brain a break from, from the stimulation that's happening and your reaction, learning to be able to manage your environment internally, um, meditation is helpful for that. And I put mindfulness in with that because they, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, mindfulness is basically learning how to be in the moment without judgment. So cultivating a practice like that you know, so, you know, being in the moment without judgment, you have that thought, oh, I'm worthless. I don't do anything. That's a judgment. You know, learning to, to catch yourself on that judgment. Um, and the final thing is self-care. Now, self-care is one of those things that I think sometimes gets a bum rap. Um, it's not just about me time or spa days. Well, some of those things are important. Um, that's a pretty limited version of self-care. I wrap all these other things up into self-care, you know, exercise. Is that part of, of, of what you do? I know personally, you know, I run a couple of days a week. If I don't run, I can hardly stand to be around myself because I get so irritable and grumpy. Um, are you taking your medication like you're supposed to? Are you going to the doctor when you need to go to the doctor? If something comes up, are you taking care of it? Are you in general taking care of your business? And I think this is one that I, you know we can debate. But like, are you are you keeping your house up? Are you keeping your living space up? Are you paying your bills when you're supposed to? Attending to those type of things is good self care and should be part of what you do on a regular basis. Because what happens when you let those things go? It builds and builds and it just contributes to this overwhelming feeling. So, you know handling your business on a regular basis, basis is good self-care. Um, finding what's important to you, you know, is it spending time in nature? You know, is it not losing sight of humor? Humor is a great way to deal with all of these, all of these th feelings and thoughts. And sometimes we don't, you know, give credit to just taking a time out or laughing at some stupid joke or looking at stupid memes. Um, what is it that, that helps you kind of stay on the most even keel as possible? Connection, calling someone, um, reaching out to people that you care about, or you know, is art important? Do you need to create? Do you need to craft? Finding those things that give your life meaning and, and joy. So I talk a little bit about the the little tweaks, and I actually don't think this is a little tweak. I think this is, is pretty big, is pay attention to your self-talk. Um, what are you telling yourself on a regular basis? You know, um, is it that you're worthless? You can't do anything right? Um, you know, what are those things that you're telling yourself? I can't handle it, you know, on a regular basis. Pay attention to what that is because we send ourselves 
so many conscious and so and subconscious thoughts throughout the day that we're reinforcing that negativity or that that con that thought that we can't handle things all day every day long and i think a very good kind of you know intervention here is would you say the things that you're saying to yourself to your kids or your loved one or your best friend you know your spouse would you say those things would you tell your kids or would you tell your spouse that they were worthless 99% of the time the answer is no and the answer is no because if you talk to somebody else that way they're not going to want to hang out with you at all their your relationship is going to be fractured they're going to think that you're a jerk and they're not going to want to hang out with you but we tolerate that kind of self talk those kind of messages to ourselves all day every day so learning to kind of have a little more self compassion and to talk to yourself in a in a less judgmental more compassionate tone is a really helpful way to start um, but you got to know what you're saying first what are those things that you're telling You know, no wonder you're feeling pretty down because why would you want to hang out with yourself if, if you're if you're saying those negative things all the time um going back to the social media um or spending time online i think this is something that that really leads to a lot of depression and anxiety right now you know there's the whole compare and despair um, Brene brown has a great quote you know that about this is, you know, when we get online, we look at people on Facebook or Instagram, you know, we see all the awesome things that they're doing, you know, and we compare that to, you know, all the awful things like, well, I'm not, I'm not making that great meal or we didn't go on an awesome vacation like that. And Brene Brown says, you know, we compare their highlight reel to our blooper reel. Um, so I think we have to be really conscious about how much time we're spending on, you know, Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, or whatever it is, Twitter, ah, Twitter is, that's like a, a breeding ground of negativity and conflict, you know, so, you know, how much time are you spending there? You know, um, is that healthy for you? Um, another little tweak, if you are spending a lot of time, who are you listening to? Who are you following? You know, are you constantly watching the news? Are you constantly looking at um, conflict-filled material? You know, that's not healthy for you. Limit your news intake. Surround yourself with healthy people and material um, and, and limit the negative. You know, you can still be connected without being connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without watching, watching the news for five hours a day. That's not healthy limit it. Um, the final one, and I could really talk a lot about this, but I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of the time here, is look at your boundaries. Um, a lot of times when we have poor boundaries, that really erodes at our, our mental health and can lead us to feeling depressed or more anxious. You know? So are you saying no? Are you saying yes when you really should be saying no? You know, are you taking on more than you should? You know, that's a boundary issue. Being able to say, oh, no, I really can't do that right now. And that's really hard for a lot of us. Um, another thing in regards to boundary is, boundaries are, are you taking things personally when they aren't? You know, so did somebody say something, you know, like you're at a co with a coworker and you say something and, uh, you're in a meeting and she looks at you and rolls her eye, rolls her eyes, and immediately you think, "What did I do wrong? You know, is she mad at me or she think I'm stupid? You know, when in reality, you don't know that, right? You don't know that she feels that way, and you're personalizing her behavior when it, she rolled her eyes because of could have been a hundred different reasons why, but you're initially or you're immediately taking it on as something that you did wrong or it's about you. So boundary work, good boundary work is really helpful in managing your mental health. 
Um, I added this slide in here because I think that the, this goes a little bit with like, you know, do you talk to yourself like you would talk to your kid or someone you love? And this is a nice way to just start to think about challenging your thoughts or changing your thinking. So this comes from the, you know, from cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a really good building block of learning about your emotions and emotional um, management and just even, I guess, emotional intelligence. You know, looking again at that, how your thoughts are connected to your feelings, connected to what you do, connected to how that feels in your body in relation to any situation. Um, so a great place to start is looking at unhealthy thought patterns. So unhealthy thought patterns are things that we all do, like, like thinking traps, sometimes they're called, or cognitive distortions. Um, they're ways or patterns of thinking that ultimately are not healthy and are incorrect. So a good example of this is um, uh, black and white thinking. So like things are either right or they're wrong, right? There's no in between. Um, either, either I am, this is perfect or it's a total failure. Uh, another example of it is magnification or minimization. So magnification is kind of like something small happens, like uh, the cashier at the grocery store, um, was snotty to you, <laughs> you know, and magnification would be like, could you believe what she did? And I can't believe she did that and making a mountain out of a molehill. That's an unhealthy thought pattern. The flip side of that is minimization is when we tend to downplay something that is actually pretty significant. So, you know, ways I've seen this is, you know, um, yeah, my mom died last year, but you know, it, it's really not a big deal. I'm over it. I work through it, you know? So that's minimizing the impact of something that was pretty significant. And both of those things are thinking traps. They're unhealthy thought patterns. Um, one of my favorite, I guess there's two really mind reading and jumping to conclusions. When we think we know what a person is, is thinking. So we just go with it. So um, I do this with my husband all the time. Like I'll think he's thinking a certain thing and then I'll get a little angry about it. When in reality, I have no idea what he's thinking. I'm just going with it. And that kind of goes with jumping to conclusions as well. So, you know, I encourage you kind of, if, if you're interested in that, just, just do an internet search, Google, you know, unhealthy thought patterns or cognitive distortions. And you're going to find lots of good material about that because that's a great way to start challenging your thoughts and to, to start tweaking those thoughts that contribute to your overall anxiety or depression. Now, these questions here are, are a nice little tweak to how to challenge those negative thoughts. You know, um, we talked about the one about how uh, you would talk to a loved one. And this is, this is a way to get out of your own mind and give you some perspective. So is this thought helping or me or hurting me? Is this thought serving me well? Um, you know, what would I say to a loved one? Yeah. What's another way to look at this? Um, let me go back to that just real quickly. There are, we talk about resources here in a minute. There are a lot of great apps that you can download load on your phone that can help with this. Um, if you go into your app store, or I think, you know, if you have an Android, the, your Google Play Store, and just type in CBT, um, there's going to be some apps that pop up that help help you learn this emotional language, this emotional um, intelligence. You know, it's going to start to look at, you know, how your thoughts are connected to your mood and all of those things. Um, the one that I kind of recommend is Mood Notes um, and there's CBT Companion. Um, some of them are free. Some of them are like $5, but it's a great way to kind of to get started. Um, 
if you or anyone you know is Oh, there's a typo, experiencing thoughts of suicide or self-harm, you know, take action. Um, every county has a local crisis number and Clarion and in Jefferson, I believe that is through um, the Center for Community Resource. And that's the texting number there at the bottom. Um, so the texting is nice, especially for younger people because they can text, they feel more comfortable with that. Um, there's also Venango County, I believe, uses the National um, Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, reach out to your local crisis, and they can they can either do they can come out to you depending on what's going on, or they can walk you through it. Um, if you don't have access to that, go to your nearest emergency room. Um, I think you should always take any any um, suicidal thoughts seriously. Um, and and have have do something about it. Take some action. Not that you necessarily need to go to the hospital, but to talk to a professional. Okay. So what are the next steps? And um, I want to just talk briefly about what you can do. Um, I think the first thing is to know that you're not alone. Talk to someone you trust. You know a family member, a friend, a pastor, a teacher, um, a colleague, someone you trust about what's going on. You don't have to be alone in that. Um, talk to your doctor, talk to your family doctor. You know, you always want to, you know, rule out anything physical or medical that's going on. And, you know, talk to your doctor about what your options are and what's going on, what your symptoms are. Um, they might want to screen you for, you know, your thyroid function. Thyroid sometimes can mimic um, depression or, or anxiety symptoms. So talk to your family doctor. Um, that's a great place to get started. They're a great resource. They're not going to judge you and they're going to understand uh, what you're doing or what, what's happening with you. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, sometimes people are afraid to talk to their doctors about this because they're afraid they're just going to be put on medication. Um, and, you know, I think I run into two different um, feelings about medication. Either, yes, put me on an antidepressant and I'll feel better. That's all I have to do. Or I'm never taking medication because I don't want to be on it forever. And again, we're on both ends of the spectrum there. And, and neither one of those is necessarily healthy or right. You know, just because you start medication doesn't mean that you have to be on medication forever. You know, sometimes medication just helps decrease the symptoms enough so that you can do those self-care things or you can do therapy. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to be on it forever. It's a conversation. It's an ongoing dialogue between you and, and your doctor or your therapist or your psychiatrist or whoever it is. Many, many primary care doctors are comfortable with prescribing antidepressants. Um, the other end is, oh, I just get on an antidepressant and I'll feel better. Um, that, that's not the fix all either. You know, it can be, you know, medication along with therapy and good self-care is just as important. Um, and the final thing is, you know, find a therapist that's a good fit for you. And I want to talk briefly about that because a lot of people don't understand how to do that or what that means. Many health insurances have behavioral health benefits included. So it'd be just like going to a specialist. So um, on here, I just kind of included, you know, some questions, you know, to call and ask your insurance company, you know, the number on the back of your card. Um, if you're trying to find a fit therapist, you know, call and ask them for local therapists that are in network with your plan. Um, ask them if you have behavioral health benefits. And if you do, you know, how much is it going to cost you to go? You know, what's your, what's your copay or your coinsurance? Or do you have a deductible? And ask if you have a limit to your mental health benefits. Um, sometimes finding a therapist can be tricky, especially in, in our rural areas and in finding uh, specialists. So talk to your, your PCP, talk to your doctor. They're more, they're likely to have a good referral source for you. Um, use Psychology Today. It's a website that a lot of therapists use to advertise. Um, so you, they have little bios, they have little snapshots of what they do. So you get to know them a little bit, but all you do is you put in your zip code and you can find a local therapist. 
Um, and finally, ask a friend. Um, more people have taken advantage of therapy or been in therapy than you probably realize because it's not something people talk about a lot. Um, so, so ask around. Um, I think this is really important. Every time somebody comes in and talks to me, I tell them, it's really important that you feel comfortable with me. You know, you have to have a good relationship with whoever you're, you're with. So do your research, ask for a quick consultation, ask for some, you know, these are some sample questions that you can ask. And most importantly, you know, assess your own comfort level. If you don't feel comfortable with your therapist, talk to them about it first and keep looking. You know, I know personally, if I, if, if a client would talk to me about that, I would be more interested in them getting the help they need with somebody that they feel comfortable rather than it being with me. And that's a really important part of the process. If you, if you don't feel like it's working, move on, find somebody else. So just a few names there. Um, so here are some resources. We talk about meditation, calm, insight tip, timer and 10% happier are meditation apps and they all have some element of free in there that you can kind of just get used to to start thinking about like how to how to develop those mindfulness skills or how to develop that um, that meditation practice meditation does not have to be sitting with your legs crossed for an hour you know you know chanting mantras it can be guided meditations and you can start with two or three minutes. Um, I really encourage you to check that out. Um, the Center for Community Resources is a local uh, nonprofit agency that can hook you up with the resources that you need. Um, and of course, online, the SAMHSA and Mental Health America have a, has a ton of information. Um, and I know that Aaron's working on putting together some books for the library, and I also am going to get her um, a resource guide that I use. So I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I really believe in, uh, you know, prioritizing our mental health and having this discussion, pushing through the stigma of, of getting the help that we need or naming it what's going on. So many times we look at mental health issues as a character flaw. You're lazy or you can't handle things. Depression and anxiety are disorders. They're diseases. Um, and we should be treating them as such. You can recover. You can, you can feel better. Just because you're depressed now doesn't mean you're always going to be depressed. Or just because you're anxious now doesn't mean you're always going to be anxious. And, you know, it's not a character flaw on your part because these things are happening to you, you know, and comparison that I use a lot is, you know, you know, if you had diabetes or if you had had cancer, would you hesitate to do the things that you need to do to go to the doctor or to talk about it? You wouldn't because it just doesn't make sense. You know, you, you would go, you would take your insulin, you would talk to the doctor, you would look at your diet if you were diabetic. If you had cancer, you wouldn't hesitate to, to do what the doctor said, right? Um, when we think about depression and anxiety, we need to think of it in that way, not hesitate to get the help that you need. So I just wanna thank you for your time. Thank, thank Aaron for, for hosting this. Um, if you have any questions, um, we'd be happy if you reached out to us. Um, here's some of the resources we used today. And um, thank you. All right, Angie, there was one question that came through. Um, lady is retired. She lost her mother two years ago this year, her mother, her sister, and she did everything together. Doesn't really remember much of last year, but this year seems so much worse, especially as Christmas is a big deal in our family. I just do not seem to be able to deal. I just want to talk to mom. Do you have any suggestions or advice? So this kind of brings up the question of grief, you know, and um, where grief and depression kind of coincide. You know, there's no timeline on grief and it certainly sounds like you're, you're grieving your mom. Um, but if things are getting worse, I think I would go talk to somebody about it, you know, um, 
give yourself an outlet or a way to cope with those feelings. Um, you know, certainly you're always going to miss your mom, you know, and grief is, grief goes in cycles, you know, you can feel good, but it always comes back to it. And that's part of the grieving process. But if you find yourself kind of, if things getting worse, I think I would go talk to somebody. I hope that answers that question. Angie, I do believe you do telehealth services as well, uh, as many therapists do in their area. So if you are concerned about um, going out and seeing somebody face to face, that is often an option as well to have a telehealth, a video or a phone call chat with somebody as well. Yeah, and let me add to, to that too, Erin, that most insurance companies cover that now, including Medicare. You know, so the pandemic has kind of really pushed a lot of that through. So, so most insurance companies cover that just like it would be a regular in-person appointment. I'm glad you brought that up. And that also, you know, increases the access, you know, so you could probably find a therapist anywhere in Pennsylvania. It doesn't have to be in a local area if you're willing to do online, which really opens up you up to, you know, a higher level of specialists, a, a higher level of quality and variety. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um. You can, I have, I'm starting to gather a list of professionals as well. Um, but definitely call your health insurance company and see what is covered for that. A lot of insurance companies just have a dial a nurse kind of line as well. So if you don't want to fully dive into getting a therapist and go through the whole process, there are a lot of, I know my husband's job has one where you can just dial a number and talk to somebody. Um, and I know that like, it's similar to the suicide hotline in a way they don't really talk to you about, they don't get in depth into the situation, but they can help you through a crisis and give you some strategies more specific to your situation. And there are a lot of, you know, um, I'm sure you've seen like better help advertise. There's a lot of like texting services out there now too. And that's a great way to start. A lot of employers offer um, an employee assistance program, which is not, you know, formal therapy, but, you know, as part of your, your benefits, you have the ability to go talk to somebody maybe three or four times without any fee. And it's just part of, of that package of services. Are there any other questions from people on the line? We can get those answered. If not, uh, keep an eye out on the email that I'll be sending out later, and we'll also be posting this on our Facebook page. Um, we'll have the recording of this webinar posted, and also the resource list that Angie is providing, and a list of everything that we have on our OverDrive website, which is the digital books and audiobooks for you that you can get, use on your phone or tablet or computer. I also wanted to just take a second and promote the webinar we have coming up next week which is our supporting teen mental health with Cara Raybuck. If you are interested in that one, um, you can register for that at oilcreek.org slash events. Uh, this is going to be primarily for those who are around teens talking about how you can support the teenagers in your life, especially in the time that we're in and the specific challenges for teenagers that are a little bit different than what is the challenges for an adult um, because of the way their brain develops and those things. So if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Angie has her email in the slides. My email is consultant at oilcreek.org. And I hope you guys have a great holiday season and that we get through it. <laughs>